what were some things as you continued to learn that, you know, a skill set of a trainer, oftentimes, you know, the, the, the nuts and bolts of the technical, the biomechanics, very low barrier of entry when it comes to reaching the objective measure of, of the client, right? Like, you know, the, you, as long as they don't get hurt and it doesn't really take much to make an exercise safe enough for someone to go through, lose weight, and then for them to not get hurt. What were the big things you started to focus on as you developed as a coach to continue to develop understanding that coaching is, you know, much more multifaceted, uh, and, and much more dimensional than than training is. What are things that when you you look at or started to look at your skill set, be like, I need to start bolstering this. This is where I need to start paying more attention to. These are the big rocks that makes coaches great. For me, it was the human relationship side for sure. And as much as that was something that early on I alluded to, being a passion of mine, I can remember you know working behind the bar at my parents' restaurant, and you're meeting all kinds of different personalities, and you have to have this ability. Um, to kind of relate to these people and hold a conversation, whether it's a short-term transient today conversation, you never see this person again. There's an authenticity piece there that's important uh, or whether it's a regular customer, you know, like you have to be able to kind of meet the person where they're at, start to look at, and you know, this was all subconscious at the time, but it's something that I've consciously started to work on. And I think, you know, working with athletes made it very clear that this was very important. Uh, the idea of reading body language, the idea of tuning into, you know, preferred communication methods, the ability to have strategies when someone comes in and presents a certain way that may be atypical or, or different from their baseline personality style um, or personality type rather. And so I think that's that was very clear to me pretty early because as I spoke about before, it seemed like this world was so far away from what I was capable of interacting with or even being around now all of a sudden i'm in my early 20s and you know there's the a-list celebrities of the athletics world in this facility and i'm the guy that's like has to go and change their weights or construct the program or whatever it is and you realize like okay they're struggling in a lot of ways with very simple exercises so it's pretty easy to tell that like everyone's doing pretty rudimentary basic exercises here at least in a certain phase of training that's already taken care of, right? They're going to, that's pretty low hanging fruit. They're going to progress with this. I already know what challenging exercises look like. And I can see them right now doing very easy exercises. So let's just continue to let them kind of stay the path there and naturally they'll progress. But on the other side, you would see different styles of personalities emerge, different people who would control the music, people that wouldn't want to control the music, people that had respect for those who controlled the music, people that disliked whatever music was on, right? And so you see these natural kind of behavioral patterns sort of emerge. You see cliques start to form. You see people who carry themselves a certain way, how they come in at 6 a.m. versus the 3, you know, the 3 p.m. group or whatever it is. And I think that's what I started to tap into it and prioritize at that point. Now, when this became conscious and tapping into it, there's, there's, there's it becoming conscious where you're noticing these trends. And then there's you know, really diving deep into them what was the first maybe communication principle? You mentioned a few. You talked about body language. You talked about atypical behavior. What was the, the first that under in the pursuit academically, extracurricularly, where you're like, wait a minute, I'm going to start actually looking into what is the science behind this type of trend that I'm recognizing, which I think is like, you know, it's, it's almost just a regular pattern of curiosity and inquisition. Like we're just have this superseding awareness that brings something to our conscious thought. And then we, we go through and we deliberately expound on it. Do you remember, or maybe you could even share a few of those principles. And as you dug deeper than the surface level awareness of them, sort of what you learned and how that learning started to evolve your coaching further. Yeah, I would say it's the priority of or how we prioritize the limbic system or how the limbic system really affects our behavior, the limbic system being responsible for our emotional responses uh, and really how we as humans have kind of this negativity bias. Um, so when you look into some of the science around the psychology of human behavior, it's very clear why we remember one of my favorite movies is uh, Rounders, Matt Damon, Ed Norton, John Malkovich. Have you seen it? Yeah, 100 years ago. Like, out, outstanding movie, cult classic. I watch it probably once a year. Uh, and so Matt Damon, the character in that movie, talks about how 
he can rem he can remember some of the great hands that he had as this kind of underground poker star, um, but those fade immediately whenever he has a bad beat, and it's the bad beat that he starts to remember all the details of with like painstaking recollection and accuracy over time, and eventually that's the only memory that he has. So he doesn't necessarily have this recollection of how he built up his bankroll as this underground poker star, but he, can rem he can't stop thinking about the time that he lost it all because negative emotions have such, uh, you know, such control over our behavior, over our decisions, uh, and eventually those decisions lead to new experiences and new memories and shape our biases as, as, as human beings. And I think the acknowledgement of some of those goes such a long way. And so that was probably the principal concept for me was, we unavoidably have this, you know, bias towards negativity. So I think being aware of that, you know, is, is definitely a place to start. Now, limbic system, like you kind of jumped off a cliff there. For, I was like, hey, you, you kind of notice people at 9 a.m. were different than people at 3 p.m. And then you kind of like went down the neuro rabbit hole. Like when you got into when you got into the this extracurricular study of of, of communication, did you anticipate it at first to go so deep? Did you anticipate to be exploring it at the level of the neurophysiological? Like, and, and how has understanding that, you know, one of the things that I always make the comparison to is like a really expensive watch, right? Like, you know, really expensive watch it still just tells you the time. And whenever we look at the brain, we have all of these inner workings and these movements and, you know, but at the end of the day, it just, it, 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 it's insightful. It's sophisticated in the sense that the, the action is, is, is very precise. Mm hmm one, were you, were you surprised by the depths of how far this stuff could go for something that is so by nature autonomic? And then two, have you found yourself, have you found yourself self-critical as a byproduct of it? Or, or how do you then understanding all this, does it, does it change the way you are fundamentally? Like, is it, is it something where when you learn this and you can't unlearn it, you start to become, because I've seen this in, in people who start to dive into this is like, they don't, they understand that we can sh sort of shape shift and then they forget sort of who they are in, in essence. And the one thing I've noticed about you is you always, you always show up and you're always you, you know, there's a snap or a clap or a distance or, or a tone or a volume that changes. But how was navigating that sort of pedagogical pursuit of communication in the early days? And how have you learned to assimilate that into the way you practice? I think it inherent. It's it's challenging. It's definitely challenging. You question yourself. You question who you've been, who you want to be. These types of things, and I think that's all part of the process, right? Like I think that in the pursuit of being a better communicator, you know, in the pursuit of having a better understanding of human behavior, of psychology, these types of things, inherently it comes back to this idea of the process, right? And that's such a general word that gets thrown around a lot, maybe even bastardized at times, but. Ultimately, what, what, what I take from that when I think of the process is slow down, right? This idea of the ability to just understand and appreciate the moment for what it is as an opportunity to improve and nothing more, nothing less, right? And so uh, there's this, this concept in Japanese culture that's called kintsugi, which speaks specifically about, it kind of falls under a broader uh, umbrella turn, which is hilarious, wabi sabi, but I'll get to that later. Let's just talk about kintsugi for a second. So kintsugi is there are you know these ceramic bowls that that are popular in Japanese culture, and there's an, a transience or an impermanence that is fundamental to both kintsugi and wabi sabi. Wabi sabi is more of a philosophy, like an overarching philosophy, is of appreciating the impermanence and the transience of our experiences here on Earth. This idea of less is more appreciating the moment for what it is. To me, that speaks to the process. When we look at kintsugi or this art of these ceramic bowls, there's an appreciation that when the bowl breaks or there's a crack in the bowl, the breakage and the repair are actually part of the history of the object. So it's almost like you're waiting for the time that this bowl is going to break so that you can fix it. And the art behind these, the repair of these bowls is that typically those, those lines, those cracked lines, when you have to put the two pieces back together, are created with this like acrylic powder that's either gold or platinum or silver. So it almost elevates the object and not only just says like, we repaired this object, 
or put it back together, we're highlighting the fact that this is exactly where it broke because we want you to know that it's such a fundamental part of the history of this object. So I think concepts like that and thinking about human nature, thinking about human behavior, a lot of people struggle with whether they're high performance athletes or not. A lot of people struggle with what, like, I, I'm feeling anxious about this stage of the process. Our ability as coaches to tap into what exactly they're anxious about is important. But this overarching philosophy of reinforcing that, listen, it's okay. Like, this is just a small part of the process. This is today. We just have to win today. This is, this is the plan. We have a plan. You can have confidence in the plan. Here's the evidence of success. But let's just remember that everything, including today, is an opportunity that if you waste it, it's gone. It's transient. It's impermanent, right? So I think when people, when you help people refocus on the process or bringing it back to the moment, it's, it's pretty powerful. So it sounds like that would be advice sound for both an athlete and a coach. As you've kind of developed within the coaching space, what have you had a more difficult time? What's a more difficult group? And maybe there's no answer to this, but as you now coach coaches on, you know, amongst other things, communication principles and coaching, but also simultaneously coach athletes, what are maybe the similarities and differences between, you know, coaching coaches and coaching athletes when it comes to communication, like what are the roadblocks that you run into with each population and how do those roadblocks either uh, compare or contrast? Yeah. Address, addressing their fundamental insecurities in some way that's still within scope and that doesn't make me a therapist or that I, you know, I'm treating them or diagnosing them or anything like that. Just talking people through that. I think when you recognize that people tend to, project their insecurities either on one end of the spectrum or the other. People tend to either shy away and be very meek and calm and in the background and they stand at the back of the class and they don't put their hand up to answer questions. That's, that's one form of, of kind of representing a, and not, not that it's always an insecurity. Someone may be very confident and they just want to observe and that's cool. Uh, maybe you're wrong as a coach in your initial assessment that kind of comes with conversing with the person and understanding them better. And then the other side of it is, is almost this overcorrection, this bravado, this machismo, this confidence, um, the person who interrupts you when you're speaking, the person who can't wait to put their hand up. And again, there's always, you know, a spectrum that doesn't mean everyone that puts their hands up or interrupts you is, is overly confident or needs to be talked to or put in their place or whatever. But these are just tendencies of human behavior. And I think those parallel, you know, I would say there's a lot more similarities than differences in my relationship with coaching coaches and my relationship with coaching athletes, which is why at the end of the day, it's called human behavior. It's not called coaching behavior or client behavior or athlete behavior. It's humans as a whole. So it's, these are the, the patterns that we tend to adopt. These are, you know, the, the psychological rabbit holes that we tend to go down. Um, and there's a reason for them. And I think the best way to start addressing those or the best way to start getting better at them is by looking within and sort of appraising the strategies that you have. Do Am I someone that interrupts people? You know, like audit that a bit. Am I someone that tends to sit back in certain situations? What environments bring out what type of behaviors for me? And then you start to ask yourself why and go down that rabbit hole. Now, before the process of you know, deliberate understanding of human communication, uh, that undertaking that you, you've, the rabbit holes that you've gone down, uh, you know, since becoming aware of this being such a, a, a transfixing and transcendent part of what you've always done. What were some like early lessons that you learned and maybe how did you learn them? Like, you know, the, there's, there's guard. And what's one of the joys I think of training athletes is that there's, you know, there's an unfiltered nature, there's an urgency and there's a, you know, in some cases just a lack of, of shame or a uh, Fox to coin a phrase. What are some early lessons that you learned where you're like, hey, man, like hey, when you oversee another coach, be like, let me tell you, son, like this is how this is going to end up. Yeah, I, I think it's the same lesson over and over again. And I don't, I don't think I'll ever stop learning it. It's that you, you don't always get it right. You don't bat a thousand, you know, like you may have this assessment of or you may have this, you know, potential assessment of how someone behaves. And maybe you've asked certain calculated questions to better understand them um, and you you know, emotions are challenging. Emotions are challenging. So let's say they're in the heat of the moment. You have an athlete who's 
a bit quieter and you're trying to break the surface, you're trying to get to know them a little bit better and they hit you with like a cold shoulder and they turn around, don't answer your question and walk away. I've had that happen, right? Like it's, it's challenging. And I think the lesson there for me is like, don't, don't take that personally. As hard as it sounds, it's like, you know, it's, you have to play the long game a little bit too. It's, I think when you learn something new, when you hear about something new that you're like, oh my God, this human behavior, I don't know anything about that. I need to apply this immediately. Just like if they learn any, you know, the training principles that you guys teach in level one, it's like mind blowing for some trainers, right? And they're like, I need to do this all the time with every client starting yesterday. And it's like, okay, cool. Even if you do that, you're, you're not going to be batting a thousand. You're not going to be awesome at it. You're not going to be Jordan Shallow uh, right out, out of the gates. It's, it's oh, hopefully it's something you can build to over time. Um, and I think the, the awareness, the conscious piece, and, and also give yourself a pat on the back. Like if you, if you look at these concepts and you think, damn, that's something I want to learn more about. A lot of people are going to hear this and be like, ah, whatever. I've been coaching for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, 20 years, five years, whatever. I know what I'm doing. I don't need to learn any of this stuff. Uh, and I think, you know, it doesn't hurt you until it does. I think once you, when you lose a client that you potentially could have retained because they walked away because of some difference in your relationship or how that changed over time, you know, that's money in your pocket. That's, that's, uh, that's not insignificant. So I think for me, the lesson was definitely you're not always right. And you have, you have to have strategies yourself when it does go wrong, particularly on the gym floor.